What's going on YouTube? It's Siege back again with another video. Today we are finishing off my updated three round NFL mock draft with round number three. But before we get started, want to showcase the best players still available on the board so you know where we are at to this point in the draft. But if you missed yesterday's video, that was round two. If you missed Friday's video, that was round one. I highly encourage you to go back and check those videos out just for the context to where we are today with trades and players taken, all that sort of fun stuff. But Hopefully you all enjoyed today's video. If you do, be sure to hit that like button. It seriously would help me and the channel out a ton. If you're new around here, be sure to hit that big red subscribe button. Lots more draft content on the horizon. And of course, the most important thing you can do is tell me your thoughts on this mock draft down below. Whether it's all three rounds or just round three here today, let me know who your favorite team is and whether you like the haul I gave your squad, you didn't, or if you're somewhere there in between. And let me hear your rationale. Let me hear you explain why you liked, love, or were somewhere there in the middle on that said pick. But... With all that down, let's go ahead and jump into it. Starting with the Chicago Bears, we're going to give them interior offensive lineman Joe Tipman. Now, I know they signed Nate Davis, so maybe they're done on the offensive line, but I think they could do better than uh, Lucas Patrick there at center. So let, let's let's draft Tipman here. I almost prefer Cody Whitehair to be able to play center and then maybe you draft a guard, so maybe they'll do more work in free agency. But nonetheless, let's just say they don't do anything else. Tipman becomes that center and an upgrade over Lucas, and then we're going to keep Cody White here at left guard. And all of a sudden, that offensive line looks like it's in pretty good shape. And again, you know, maybe it's Tevin Jenkins even moving over to left guard and, and White here at center. So maybe I'm drafting a luxury here, but also another alternative Moving on from Cody Whitehair, who's been really inconsistent and makes a lot of money. So even if you do want to play Tevin Jenkins, maybe Titman is the replacement long-term to Whitehair. Just a couple of ideas, and I still think interoffensive line round three is in play for Chicago. Houston Texans, I'm going to give him Isaiah Foskey. I was uh, really shocked to see him still on the board here at 65, but presents really, really good value for the Houston Texans, uh, adding one more edge there into the mix, uh, and a team that desperately needs it. Yes, I know we we went uh, defensive line at 12, but I don't think they should stop there. Just because you get one guy doesn't mean that you're all done. Jonathan Grenard hasn't played more than 450 snaps in a season. And it's had some moments, but that's such a small sample size. We don't know if it's the true outcome of it. And then Jerry Hughes is old. So like you need two edge rushers. So I don't mind Houston doubling up whatsoever. And Foskey, to me, is really a second round pick. So if he makes it to day three or round three, rather, sprint the card in. Next up, Arizona. This is where we're going to give them the interior offensive lineman. Thought about it at 34, but instead, we're just going to go ahead and draft a starter in Jarrett Patterson. Nothing flashy, not the most crazy athlete by any stretch, but multi-year starter at Notre Dame, a school known for developing NFL offensive linemen. I think that's what you're getting here. Guard center flexibility. Wherever Patterson plays, left guard or center, he's going to be a solid starter for you right away in Arizona. Then we get to Denver at 67, and then 68. I'm going to go Garrett Williams here. I'm still a big fan of, of, of Garrett Williams. Really good footwork, and he profiles as a, a solid man press corner. So him and that Vance Joseph defense is really an interesting fit. But at Syracuse, he played a lot of off zone. So he has the makings of one thing while playing drastically a different coverage type uh, at Syracuse. So ultimately, I think that might round out his skill set, make him competent in zone coverage while having the potential to be a really solid man coverage corner. And that becomes a valuable add considering they moved on from Ronald Darby. And uh, yeah, I think they could just use another starter opposite of Patrick Sertan, which when you have Pat Sertan, you just need a competent dude on the other side. And I think Garrett Williams is more than that. Uh, so then moving on to pick 68, I do want to add a safety. Kareem Jackson is a free agent. No guarantee that they get him back. So I'm going to draft Jordan Battle. I'd love to see me some split safety looks with Justin Simmons and Jordan Battle. Whew, that could be crazy. But if you draft Battle here, just because you know he's... He's a, he's a good athlete, not great. He probably features better as a strong safety, someone who's playing in the box. And then Justin Simmons will have to work as that over-the-top free safety. I think Simmons is well-rounded enough to be more than capable of doing that. So I think this allows you to kind of keep the status quo. Simmons is the free, and then Battle's going to step in for Kareem Jackson at strong safety. Then we get the Rams at pick 69. Another edge rusher I've been more often than not working into the second round post-combine. Uh, but Byron Young lasts just a little bit longer. And hey, the Rams needed edge rusher when they had Leonard Lloyd or Leonard Floyd. Now they don't have him, and I'm looking at the dudes on our lads, and I'm like, yeah, these are not the answers. So getting Byron Young to fall in your lap in the third round is really, really solid value. 6'2", 250, 4'4", speed. Do I need to say more? Obviously a huge position to need, and they're kind of rebuilding there on the defensive side. So getting a young piece like this and a multi-year starter at Tennessee, I think, is a step in the right direction. 
Next up, Las Vegas at pick 70. We're going to go defensive lineman Mozzie Smith. Another guy that could certainly go in the second round, but didn't test the combine. I was kind of bummed by that. I know injuries has gotten in the way of that. But nevertheless, I've been looking for the Raiders to add a big body D, D tackle and specifically a run stopping one. Sometimes I, I, I tend to give them, you know, I, I'll give them like a Gervon Dexter who's Solid run defender right now, but I think about the pass rush upside when I think about Dexter. Uh, Mozzie Smith, I'm focusing on the run defense that week over week got better and better at Michigan. Year over year, got better and better stopping the run with the Wolverines. So feels like he's on the right track there and obviously a freaky athlete. Anytime you're the number one guy on Bruce Feldman's freaks list, yeah, I mean, it speaks volumes. Uh, so love to see the Raiders have this type of outcome. You know, Mozzie Smith fall into their lap and then they get that two gap run stopping nose tap right in the middle of defense maybe that helps keep you know the linebackers clean that's been a problem spot for them but also helps uh maybe let max crosby and chandler jones focus on being pass rushers and especially chandler jones maybe that gets him back on track hopefully fingers crossed if you're a raiders fan next up the saints at pick 71 let's give them tank bixby i told you in yesterday's video this was going to be an offensive focused draft we went guard then tight end then running back but Sounds like Alvin Kamara is going to be facing a suspension this year, uh, which we talked about that some last year, but ultimately it sounds like the verdict is going to be uh, handed down this year. But also he's making a ton of money. If he becomes a potential cut candidate next year, and then in two years' time, it, it's it's hard to imagine him on the roster. Granted, Mickey Loomis is a wizard. <laughs> he always finds a way to minimize those cap hits, keep his stars around. So Maybe I'm crazy for saying this, but also this New Orleans team has prioritized having two running backs at all times. And I don't really think they have that number two guy to back up and pair up with uh, Alvin Kamara. So whether it's long-term the Kamara replacement or it's right here, boom, there's our number two running back. I think it brings value to the Saints offense. Next is the Tennessee Titans. And more often than not, I go speed wide receiver in the uh, second round. But this time, opts to wait till the third, and we get Marvin Mims, who can play in the slot uh, to be that Robert Woods replacement, or he can play out wide. Really productive player, three-year starter at Oklahoma, had some gaudy numbers his true freshman year, and that was when I was like, dude, Marvin Mims might be, he might be the next Hollywood Brown coming out of Oklahoma under that Lincoln Riley offense. Riley obviously goes elsewhere, and the production kind of tapered after that for Mims, but still really productive player, multi-year starter, and a guy that I think can win at all three levels, solid route runner. And then obviously the over the top speed is what I'm focusing on here for Tennessee. They're a ground and pound team. As of right now, they still have Derrick Henry. And as long as they do, I think he's going to be their identity. So then that play action over the top passing game with a guy like Marvin Mims, I think keeps defenses on us. So love the value that they got Mims with here at 72. Next is the Houston Texans. We're going to give them the tight end with their final pick. It's going to be Sam Laporta. Again, I've had these tight ends kind of linger around on the board here. So presents really good value for a position that, I just don't really think Houston has that long-term answer. You know, I think back to when they drafted Brevin Jordan, and he's just like uh, Miami tight end this year, Will Mallory. He's not really an inline tight end. He's basically a big-bodied power slot. And uh, I'd rather see them be able to get a legitimate tight end. Laporta may not be a great blocker, but he can play in line. Really good athlete. Solid testing numbers at the combine. Solid route runner. Soft hands. Productive at Iowa. Checks a lot of different boxes here and gives Houston, I think, an immediate upgrade right now, but also an answer for the foreseeable future at the position. Next is the New York Jets. And a little, little outside the box right now, they have a couple of D tackles that are out on the market. And I was just thinking about, man, Quentin Williams, I mean, Obviously, one of the best D tackles in football. Could he be the guy that helps like Gervon Dexter turn these flash moments into more consistent like brilliance? Like, could he be the guy that works with Dexter and has him really tapping that potential? Also, like I just said, Dexter at Florida was already a solid run defender. It was just you saw the moment to the pass rush and made you really excited. Maybe this guy could be a first round D tackle, but it was just nothing more than like a flashy play. So I think minimum could be a solid run defender to replace some of the guys that are out on the open market like a Sheldon Rankins, uh, but also could create a really nasty interior pass rush duo. Uh, and we talked about the Seahawks in the round one video, Draymond Jones pairing up with Jalen Carter. Oh my gosh, that interior you know pressure could be crazy. The Jets have a similar opportunity here if, they, if Dexter were to work out and uh, pair him up with Quinn Williams. That'd be really, really fun. And it just keeps that defensive line of strength for New York. Next is the Atlanta Falcons, and we're going to give them Diane Henley. Yeah, all these linebackers are pretty light, like Toho Toho is right around 230 pounds. Overshone's at like 233. Uh, Herbig, to me, is more of, a, of an edge rusher. Papo, I think, is like 229. And Henley, right around the same weight, maybe 230. So all these guys are light, but I don't really mind it for Atlanta 
because Troy Anderson, who <laughs> is this running back turned linebacker, ran the four fours, like four four two if memory serves, and he weighs like 250 pounds. So they already got a guy who has the weight to be a thumper. Let's add another freaky, rangy, coverage specialist type of linebacker. Anderson's still, I think, a work in progress when it comes to like learning how to play a linebacker. But who knows? This might be the year where it all comes together. And I think pairing him up with a guy who played six years of college football, transferred, handled the jump from Nevada to Washington State really seamlessly. Uh, and also, again, coverage specialist, sideline to sideline speed. He's 6'2", 235. It, you're going to get blocked out of play, so you better be damn good in coverage. And that's exactly what Diane Henley is. And I think here at 75, that's really solid value. So him and Anderson could become a crazy athletic inside linebacker duo for that Atlanta defense. And guys that basically cover you know a quarter of the earth with how much range uh, that they have. And then we get to the Philadelphia Eagles next up. Um, we'll see. I mean, this comes out to basically how you feel about Reed Blankenship. But let's give them Chris Smith here just in case they think maybe Blankenship is someone they'd rather have in the box. They don't want to have him play that over-the-top free safety position. They lose Marcus Epps. So replacing him with Chris Smith here, I think, makes a lot of sense. The over-the-top free safety for the 2021 and 2022 Georgia Bulldogs defense. I'd say that's a pretty awesome like uh, position to hold in some of the best defenses in college football history. So uh, speaks volumes about how good he is. And I think he is just kind of that safety that Philadelphia could really stand at as that ball hawk playmaking type of over the top safety. And I think Smith here at 76, really solid value. Back to the Los Angeles Rams. I'm going to go with Andrew Voorhees just because, again, I don't know what this team is doing. Are they blowing it up? Are they rebuilding? You know, waiting, waiting and seeing to get more information there. But Andrew Voorhees, you know, may miss his entire rookie year, but if the Rams are blowing it up, hey, well, they're perfectly kind of suited to eat that year without Voorhees. So, um, yeah, if that's their, their, if that's their game plan, blow it up, then I think Voorhees works. But also, if they don't, I think it works because they need offensive line right here right now, but also don't, don't underestimate how much then they're going to need it in two years' time. So I think Voorhees ideally could come back at some point his rookie year and, and help the Rams out now, but whenever he does come back, he gives them an upgrade on the interior offensive line, which they desperately need. Next, Green Bay Packers. I'm going to go Tuli Tua below two here. Uh, 266 pounds. I'm kind of thinking he is going to be an edge, even though they have him listed here with the defensive lineman. Um, but I, I don't know. Maybe he gains weight. Either way, uh, I think he could be someone that is added into that interior rotation at that 3-4 at the end spot or just becomes an interior rush once they go to their uh, you know nickel and dime, their you know four-man fronts and passing situations. Uh, but also, I've been trying to get them another edge rusher. A lot of times, I do it in the first round. But ideally... I'd like to see this team move on from Preston Smith in a year's time. So maybe the trio becomes Rashawn Gary, Tuli Tua Pelotu, and uh, Kingsley and Agbury. And this could even let you see an Agbury versus Tua Pelotu and just see who's going to earn that other starting edge rushing spot. And then whoever does win the job becomes your DPR, becomes your third pass rusher in the mix there in a rotation. And then, again, opens up the door for you to move on from Preston Smith. So I think a solid way to use a third-round pick in my estimation. Next. Indianapolis Colts. I'm going to give them wide receiver Parker Washington, a guy I really like. Good speed, good route running, good hands, can go win it in the air. Uh, and I think this team could use an upgrade there in the slot over Paris Campbell. And, uh, you know, I really like Michael Pittman as a, a possession. Axe, and then you got big body Alec Pierce, good vertical too, that can work the vertical route tree, the goes, the, the posts off at the comebacks to, to play off the goes. And then you get Parker Washington, who I think can you know, do a lot of various levels also a really good yards after the catch weapon uh so it just adds that one little wrinkle i think this offense could still add that underneath guy the yards after the catch ability but also enough speed to be able to push the label and push defenses uh and, and maybe cre uh, maybe create some big plays deep down the field so I like it and how it just kind of rounds out that wide receiver room in indy then we get to the pittsburgh steelers i'm gonna go clark phillips the third here yes um yeah sub 30 inch arms to me he's he's gonna be slot only uh you know that 30 uh inch threshold is, is kind of a tough one to break. Roger McCurry played on the outside last year and had some you know varying success with it. Sometimes he looked too small and sometimes he, he played fine. But Clark Phillips, yes, we're doubling up on corner here, but Joey Porter Jr. will play on the outside, paired up with Patrick Peterson. Clark Phillips III is an absolute upgrade over author, author Arthur Millette. I beg your pardon, because uh, honestly, Millette is just not all that good. So let's get an upgrade there in the nickel and Think back to Pittsburgh having Mike Hilton and how important that was for that defense. 
I think Clark Phillips can definitely do a lot of that. Was one of the best players on one of the best defenses in college football. So, uh, feels like a guy that the Steelers would add uh, into the mix. And also, he just kind of has that dog mentality, wants to tackle, uh, can be a hard hitter. So feels like he fits in there with the culture in Pittsburgh as well. Then we get to the Lions. I'm going to give him a wide receiver here, uh, Cedric Tillman. Give him that big body, DJ Chark replacement. Can be the possession dude. Uh, maybe it's a little overlap because you already have a you know volume um Possession, you know, slot wide receiver and Amon Ron St. Brown. Uh, so maybe it's a little bit of an overlap there, but different sizes. And also Tillman plays on the outside. So I think pairing him up with Williams as the, the boundary wide receivers, Amon Ron St. Brown, your number one go-to guy in the slot. It just gives you basically what you should have had full season with DJ Chark and some of what you had with Chark down the stretch. Uh, not nearly the downfield speed or anything like that, but contested catches, can work the sideline, can play, you know, when I say work the sideline, like I mean like make those catches right there along the chalk. So uh, I think that's the type of role that Tillman can play. And I think it's something that right now the Lions don't really have on the outside. Next, we get to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I'm going to give them an offensive tackle here. Then moving on from Donovan Smith, I think kind of opened up this door. I'm going to go Blake Freeland here uh, at 82. Uh, I think they do ultimately move Tristan Wirfs over to play Left tackle, and I think then Blake Freeland is going to move over to play right tackle. Good mover, six foot eight, just over three hundred pounds. Maybe could add a little bit of weight, but given his movement skills, I don't know if you really want to push it there. Uh, Multi-year starter at BYU has good tape, uh, and it kind of was the continuation of Brady Christensen. And honestly, BYU after even kind of like revisiting it, their schedule is more um, lucrative, for lack of a better phrase. It was a tougher schedule with Freeland at tackle than what it was with Christensen. So that does make me feel a little bit better about the step up in competition there. So Tampa Bay needs a tackle. They get a good value here with Freeland. Next, Seattle at 83. Um, I'm actually going to give them uh, a Jay Reed here. They just signed Jaron Reed. So this made me laugh just looking at it. But Jaden Reed, to be that slot wide receiver, I think this offense still could add I think he can win at all three route levels, you know, all three levels with his route running ability. Uh, can be a little bit of a yards after the catch guy. Enough speed. Does a lot of different things really well without having that ultimate, like, this is what you think of with Jaden Reed. Like, um, you know, Tyler Scott, it's the over the top speed. Like, I think of Tyler Scott, I think about him being a deep over the top route runner. We're going to talk about Tyler Scott actually in just a second. Jaden Reed doesn't have that one trump card, but he's really well rounded, does a lot of different things. And I think having him be the slot guy just complements uh, DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett that much more. So we went K yesterday, get Jaden Reed here. Again, we're just going all in on Geno Smith, trying to maximize what he has left. Then we get. Miami on the clock at 84. I'm going to go Tucker Craft here. Same thing I talked about with Jameer Gibbs. I think having that underneath, you know, outlet and that release option, bringing linebackers back up to the line of scrimmage, so that way you can go back to that RPO timing throw, 15, 20 yards down the field to two and Tyree Kill. We saw that a ton last year, so much so that linebackers just starting sitting in that spot. So I think you need the counter. Gibbs is a receiving back, and then I think Tucker Craft can do a lot of that same stuff as well. Small school guy, and he dominates at that level, uh, but can be an inline blocker. Had a good combine, showcased that athleticism, which makes you feel that much better that it's not just him dominating lower level competition. Maybe he's just a great athlete and belongs at a higher level school, and he's going to showcase that at the NFL level. Next up, we get to the Chargers. Going to go offensive line here. Like we said yesterday, moved on from Matt Filer. So I'm going to give you Matthew Bergeron here at 85. Um, and I think this, my plan would be Berger on at right tackle. And I even said, given that, you know, he, the best skill set he has is being a run blocker and playing with power. Everything else is just kind of solid across the boards. He might end up being just a better right tackle. And then let's just move Jamari Sawyer to left guard. Like, I think that's the easiest way to go about it. Sawyer was a left tackle slash guard uh, at uh, Georgia. So move him back into one of his two normal positions after being a solid tackle last year and played left tackle. So keep him on the same side of the line as well. And then you draft Matt Bergeron to be that starting right tackle and uh, hopefully an upgrade over Trey Pimpkins and Storm Norton of two years ago. So uh, just as a position of need, you save money by cutting Cat, uh, Matt Filer. And then uh, honestly, I think S Sawyer did look good at tackle, but I think him at guard could be awesome for the Chargers. Then we get to the Ravens here at 86. And as promised, we're going to talk about Tyler Scott. Maybe it wasn't the 4 2 40 and 40 inch vertical we were thinking at Indy, but still 4 4 speed, 38 inch vertical. That's 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 an abundance of speed and abundance of explosiveness. So I like him basically just being that, you know, uh, they had Deshaun Jackson on the roster last year. They didn't really use him like this, but uh, kind of the Marquise Hollywood Brown uh, uh, to this offense that's very run heavy. I am assuming Lamar Jackson's there. Again, I'm having to wait and see. Uh, that three year, 133 guaranteed, you know, leak, if you want to call it that, Lamar put out the other day. That was a wild tweet. But, anyways, assuming he's there, it's going to be run heavy. Safety's going to creep up. You need to have that. 
over the top, uh, you know, trump card, if you will. And I think Tyler Scott could definitely be that. And, you know, that's why I was saying, man, the Ravens, if they could just add Will Fuller, get that back after they lost Hollywood Brown. And now you have that opportunity here by drafting Tyler Scott at 86. Let me get to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, they're, they're, they're down a couple safeties, right? Like Logan Ryan's a free agent and um, uh, some of the other guys whose names now escaping me, of course. But let's get Brandon Joseph. Get him an over-the-top playmaker to pair with Antoine Winfield Jr. Becomes a really interesting uh, tandem. I think Antoine Winfield Jr. would be the guy you move around. And then you let Brandon Joseph basically play center field. And he, he was good at that at Northwestern as well as at Notre Dame. And with the Fighting Irish, he cleaned up his tackling, which makes you feel that much better that he'll be able to hold his own uh, in, in the open field at the NFL level. So he may still, you know, uh, he, he may also have a little bit of Andre Cisco in him where you know, it still gives you a little bit of hesitation if he's one-on-one with somebody with that much open, you know, real estate around them. But it's always hard for a safety to make that play. So uh, I don't know if you necessarily can hold it about uh, against him. And also if he's making plays and creating turnovers and, you know, being a ball hawk like he was in college, you, you kind of, you can turn turn the shoulder on that. You can turn the cheek, I think is actually the phrase I'm looking for uh, against maybe his weakness as a tackler. So I like trying to recoup potential lost value with safeties hitting free agency, but we'll have to wait and see. Maybe they bring those guys back. Uh, next is the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars. And I'm going to go with a nickel corner here. So uh, Jartavius uh, Martin, who actually, that's right, they have him listed as a safety from Illinois. Primarily played in the slot, and uh, that's been kind of my focus, whether it's Brian Branch or Antonio Johnson in the first round. I like adding a nickel option there, who one could help stop the run and be a blitzer, but that way we feel that much better about Darius Williams playing on the outside. I think a lot of people are looking at outside corner for the Jags when Williams is better in his career, both with the Rams and Jacksonville as a boundary corner. So let's try to find value in the nickel. And I think Jartavius Martin, after a good combine, presents that here. So it makes me feel that much better about that secondary. We drafted Derek Call yesterday, rounding out that defense at a pretty efficient way. Next, New York Giants at 89. Uh, I'm going to go with Olushigun Uluwat Timmy. Uh, one of the funner names to say in this class, but uh, just in case they don't bring back John Feliciano, plug and play center. Just as simple as that. And then you hope Josh Azudu takes a step forward in year two at left guard. And then ideally, this completes your offensive line overhaul that has spanned over the last what, three years. When did they take Andrew Thomas? I think three years ago. So uh, this basically just finishes the job there for the Giants across the O-line. Next, Dallas Cowboys. I'm going to give them uh, DeMarvin Overstone. They brought back Leighton Van Der Esch. And again, kind of like what we talked about with the Falcons earlier. O- Van Der Esch has the weight, so I don't mind Overshone checking in around 230. But you know, safety turned linebacker has a ton of potential. And this is sideline to sideline coverage specialist linebacker. Uh, cleaned up his tackling last year. You get to keep him in state for whatever that's worth. Um, and then you know I think he needs to grow as like a run defender, playing lanes and, and filling gaps and whatnot. But nonetheless, I, I think you can work with that as long as you have Van Der Esch next to him and then Overshone while he's learning is basically just a freaky coverage specialist and you lean into that safety background for Overshone. And that creates an insanely athletic linebacker tandem there in the middle of the Cowboys defense. Next, the Buffalo Bills on the clock at 91. Uh, really nice value just kind of fell into their lap here with Emil Ekior. Plug and play starter at guard. Yeah, he played right guard at Alabama. Maybe you can move him over to the left side. Or maybe it's just an upgrade over Ryan Bates, who I don't really think was all that good last year. So no matter how you spin it, an upgrade on the interior offensive line is uh, a big-time uh, addition to that offense. It's an offensive line that I think really stands to get better. Could go tackle here. Maybe Jalen Duncan, you know, draft and stash, try to develop him. Maybe get him into a camp battle with someone like a Spencer Brown. But I decided to go Ekior here. More tried and true. I think more NFL ready and a guaranteed upgrade there on the interior. Next is Cincinnati. We're going to have a little bit of a corner run here with these next two picks. We're going to go, uh, let's go Darius Rush to uh, Cincinnati. Like his arm length, tested pretty well, looks really good at the Senior Bowl too. So having a really nice, you know, uh, you know, post-regular season circuit, if you will, draft circuit, I guess, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, and then here for Carolina, let's go Eli Ricks. When we've gotten to see him, he's been really, really good. And really what excites me about Ricks potentially going to Carolina, him plus J.C. Horn, if like Ricks works out, could create an insane man press duo with Brian Burns then at edge. If these wide receivers can't get off the line, like he's gonna have all the time he needs to get to the quarterback. Like that could be a really, really scary defense, headlined by, of course, defensive coordinator Ejero Evero. So uh, maybe you flip these two, Ricks going to Cincy, Rush going to Carolina. Either way you spin it, both teams need corner. For Carolina, it's trying to find that 
guy long term. I mean, Dante Jackson's fine, I guess, but try if you can get an upgrade there, opposite JC Horn, I think that makes that defense that much better. And then for the Bengals, trying to find one more corner in the mix, you know, Jadobia Wuzier getting close to the end of his contract, Mike Hilton as well. And then, you know, I've been saying, I think Cam Taylor Britt was the plan to replace uh, Von Bell. Maybe they keep him at corner, but to me, he I thought he was a box safety coming out of Nebraska. So, Maybe he's sticking a corner, maybe he's not, but nonetheless, I think they could still add one more guy to future-proof that position. Next, Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, let's go Carl Brooks here. And I'm, I'm kind of looking at Brooks as this guy who was playing on the edge at Bowling Green and was an awesome pass rusher, one of the highest pass rush win rates in college football and one of the best, uh, uh, one of the highest pass rush grades from Pro Football Focus. Uh, smaller school guy, but the senior bowl showcased that he could hold his own and stand, uh, stand on his own two feet against, you know, obviously a lot higher level competition. And, you know, Philadelphia is known for being able to develop the trenches. So this becomes a really interesting landing spot for Brooks. And maybe Philadelphia really taps in that potential. And really, this to me is like my Milton Williams contingency, where if Williams doesn't take a step forward is not what they need. Pairing up this type of guy with that type of pass rush upside next to Jordan Davis, who in theory is a really high level run defender and this huge, you know, refrigerator of a human being there to, you know, eat blocks and plug holes. That becomes a really interesting one-two punch. So a lot of times I'm thinking about Kalijah Kansi in the first round or, or you know, Jalen Carter makes it to them at 10. I'm, that's that's who I want to pair up with Jordan Davis. They could also wait till the third round and kind of do what they did with Milton Williams and just take another swing at the bat in this draft range and have that person be who they pair up with Davis. Next is the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, I'm going to go Zach Harrison here. Honestly, I don't hate this team doubling up on edge, um, especially considering I was kind of hoping they'd keep Frank Clark as that third edge rusher. Harrison, more akin to uh, George Karloftis, last year's first rounder, versus Will McDonald, who we gave in the first round of this mock draft. Um, but nonetheless, having that third pass rusher, I think, is is something worthwhile having. And he's this you know crazy six foot five and a half, two hundred seventy five pound, like the prototype of what you could dream an edge rusher would look like. Doesn't have the bend, but that type of power, I think, could be really interesting. And who knows? Based on the matchup, you might want to have two power rushers out there. So it comes down to the team you're playing and what their tackles struggle with, but also. Just in case, maybe George Karloftis battles injuries or uh, Will McDonald gets hurt. You know, whatever ends up happening, Zach Harrison as that uh, third pass rusher, that backup, but also you can work him in as an extra DPR type. I think it brings value no matter what ends up happening next year for Kansas City. Then we get to Arizona. Um, hmm, Arizona here at 96. Let's go with let's go with Jaqueline Roy. I was thinking about maybe pivoting here, but I do think they could use a nose tackle. And Roy, after the uh, combine, didn't really showcase the uh, explosiveness I was hoping to see because he was someone who was a pretty solid pass rusher at LSU. He just didn't take games over. And I think that's just because he didn't have that type of athletic, you know, maybe ability. Maybe I was overhyping that. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that he's probably just going to be a nose tackle at the next level. And I think the, the the Cardinals definitely could use an upgrade there. This is a one or two year retool in my estimation. So Offensive line, defensive line, heavy focus here for the Cardinals. And I think adding a nose tackle is something that may not be flashy, but in the third round is good value just in front of pick 100. And then long-term, you'll be happy that you did it if you're a Cardinals fan. Next, Washington Commanders. I'm going to give them Hendon Hooker. You know, it sounds like they want to bring in a veteran to compete with Sam Howell. So I don't know if this happens, but if they don't get one of those veteran guys, then this is a pretty nice alternative. And a guy that once he's done rehabbing from an injury... Maybe, you know, if Howell doesn't look great, he can step in and start. You know, I, I think this is kind of the least least likely route that the commanders take wide, uh, quarterback-wise. So I'm sorry, Washington fans, to disappoint. But I do think Hooker's going to go somewhere here on day two. So I, I needed to get him in here. And uh, maybe Washington doesn't land one of those veteran quarterbacks as a backup option. You know, Andy Dalton's on his way to Carolina. So it's kind of like Jacoby Brissett and then maybe a few other names that come to mind. But um, I'm kind of looking at maybe Hendon Hooker as that backup here with how the board played out. I don't know. It could make sense, but don't really love it. So I do apologize there. Uh, next up, we get the uh, Cleveland Browns. I'm going to give them a, a freaky linebacker here in Owen Papo. And kind of like with a lot of the other linebackers, I'm just thinking about Jeremiah Wusu koromoa and Owen Papo, who runs a 4-3-9. I'm like, dude, you could cover so much real estate with those two guys just flying around. Uh, so it creates a lighter box, which is unfortunate. So it'd be that much more work for you know the defensive line to try to keep those linebackers clean. Uh, but man, if you can get it, those two guys would be awesome athletes right there in the middle of the defense, just making stuff happen. And Jeremiah Wusukormo is such a flexible piece that you can do so many different things with. I'd love to see how they could build upon Owen Papo. And plus, you hear people, talk, people at Auburn talk about Owen Papo, they love this dude. So I think there's something there uh, that 
should create some draft excitement around him as well. All right, then we get to uh, the beginning of the San Francisco run uh, over the next uh, three of the next five picks. But here at uh, 99, let's go Jalen Jones. He's a guy that I was a little surprised is still on the board. I think they could still use one more boundary corner. Yes, Traverius Ward's a good player. Him and Jalen Jones could create a really awesome man press duo. And again, a team with a great defensive line. So don't let the wide receivers get off the line of scrimmage. Let that pass rush eat and make their job really, really easy. That's fun to think about. Uh, also, this could be like Ambry Thomas insurance, whether he gets hurt or he just doesn't play well. And then Jalen Jones can step into that spot. Next, the Las Vegas Raiders. This was the Darren Waller trade. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't talked about it right now. So if you're still watching this deep in the video, congratulations. You get a special little trade video within uh, the mock draft. But, you know, I kind of like this trade for both sides. I know that's crazy because, you know, for the Giants, it's like, would you rather have Daniel Bellinger or Darren Waller? You know, Darren Waller, obviously, he's the more talented guy when he's healthy. The, the injury concerns are, you know, obviously that... They're just that, a concern. But when he's healthy, he's by far better than Daniel Bellinger. And you give up pick 100 for that? That's not that's not bad whatsoever. And then for the Raiders, yeah, even, even Rappaport was like, they've been talking about trading Waller for like a year plus now. I was like, yeah, they were having rumors about that right after Devontae Adams got there. Like I was honestly thinking it might be an Adams and Waller swap. So to finally make this work, you know, I think Las Vegas was knowing that like this is not a long-term answer for us. And maybe that's part of why he didn't play as much last year, right? Like I know he was injured, but I wonder if it was also like the front office just be like, no, 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 no rush, dude. Like just take it easy. Like, you know, you, you don't really fit with what we need here in this McDaniels offense. So I think that did actually kind of play a part of it. So, you know, the Raiders, they finally get to move on. They got another top 100 pick and they desperately need it. And then, uh, yeah, the, the, dude, the Giants get a huge upgrade in talent at that tight end position. So anyways... We're going to go ahead and give him a linebacker here as one of the position groups I like to address for the Raiders, but I haven't just yet. And it's going to be Henry Toe Toe, another one of those lighter linebackers, which isn't necessarily ideal. Uh, but nonetheless, multi-year starter at Tennessee and then Alabama, solid in coverage. Um, and then on top of that, plays the run really well. So where he's lighter, his instincts kick in. He fills run lanes and he's a solid tackler. So does the little things right. And I think that makes up where he's a little small and not really that great of an athlete. So... Then we get back to the San Francisco 49ers. And uh, we're actually going to double up at corner here. I'm going to go with uh, Travius Hodges Tomlinson. Basically just allows you to not bring back Jason Verrett, who's always hurt anyways. So uh, no disrespect. A really good player when he's actually out there. Really fun to watch. But Travius Hodges Tomlinson allows you to just kind of move on at that position and kind of close the door on that one. And then to round us out. I'm going to give them Jalen Duncan. And with his athletic ability, it actually makes sense as a uh, replacement for um, Mike McGlinchey, who was a really good athlete, big frame. And Jalen Duncan has the body of a first-rounder and the athletic profile and the athletic makeup of a first-rounder. She doesn't play like one. So this is kind of a, a buy low and try to draft and develop type of move here for San Francisco. And maybe it could be that Mike McGlinchey replacement. And I guess we're going to go ahead and have to make one more pick here. Pick 103 for Chicago. This was not anything that I had planned out. So you're going to get to see this one live off the cuffs. We got wide receiver, interior defensive line, edge, IOL. Um, I Honestly, I wouldn't hate to see them at a corner. Let's go Riley Moss. You know, uh, Ibrahim loves his uh, loves his zone coverage. And Moss brings a lot of size that I think you have him in that cover two uh, squat, you know, zone right there at the line of scrimmage, pressing guys to the line of scrimmage. I think that's a really interesting role for him. And plus, I think they could still add one more corner. So... There it is, you know, having to make a pick live here. Special, you guys get to see it if you're still watching this deep into the video. Let me know what you think about it down below in the comment section. What would you have done there at 103? But nevertheless, I want to scroll through this mock one more time just so you all can see each and every pick one final time as well as the trades up top. But, of course... Be sure to let me know what you thought about this mock draft down below in the comment section. You know, what picks did you like for your favorite team? Which ones did you not like? And then which ones were you kind of in between on? If you want to give me an entire, uh, you know, three round grade, or if you just want to focus on the third round, either way you spin it, I'd love to hear your thoughts and your grades down below in the comment section. And of course, let me know your favorite team. Uh, but if you guys enjoyed today's video, be sure to hit that like button. It seriously would help me out a ton. And if you all are new around here, lots of draft content still on the horizon. So be sure to hit that big red subscribe button, the screen, is really having a hard time. Mock draft database is, uh, yeah, a little laggy here, but here, here we go. So be sure to subscribe if you're new, getting back on track here. But I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. And until next time, my name is Teach. I am signing off.